not how the world celebrates, but we're here to celebrate your word and your kingdom purposes. In your name we pray, Jesus. Amen and amen. All righty. Glad you all could join us on this Christmas day. And uh, we're not here to celebrate Christmas. To the dismay, maybe, of some of you who were uh, who do celebrate Christmas, I'm sorry. Uh, I don't believe it's a Christmas Christian biblical day to be celebrating. And because of that, we're going to, our message is going to be about, well, let's call it this way, this one, my un-Christmas message. My un-Christmas message. What are we to be celebrating? Are we to celebrate the birth of Christ? That's what they, a number of people would want you to think to make it sound, the celebration of Christmas to make it sound all Christian, all holy and wonderful and joyful, joyful. Is it really? Uh, there's a number of questions. I'm only going to pose a few to you today uh, about Christmas. But I'm going to tell you right now, at the very beginning, at the very outset right here, although most of my, jo my message is not going to be getting into this, but here's what we ought to be celebrating as Christians. We ought to be celebrating the resurrection, our resurrected Savior, and what He has done and what He has accomplished for us. So I am a and always remain a resurrection Jesus Christ kingdom loving person and believer. There's a lot wrong with the Christmas celebration. I'm going to give you a number of years to kind of figure things out for age-wise for people, but I'm saying by the time you are 30, and that's really stretching things, you ought to be able to at least, if you're a Bible-reading person at all, be able to sit back and look at things and realize something's amiss, something's wrong in this worldly celebration of Christmas. Most Christians don't know that for instance, there's a difference between Easter and Passover. In fact, most of them, a lot of them, hardly realize there's a difference between Halloween and tabernacles. I mean, we could go on and on and list the various celebrations that are out there. How the world celebrates its holidays and how Christians should actually be celebrating holy days, feast. such as Feast of Tabernacle, right? Atonement, Passover. These are biblical holidays or holy days that we should be celebrating that they all have a great deal to do with Christ and His kingdom and His purposes. And they're wonderful. And when you're studying all these various feasts, they point to the kingdom of God. What does Christmas point to? Well, that's just a, a question I want to pose right here at the beginning. What does it really point to? What's its purpose, really? Why does the world engage in Christmas, quote, Christmas celebration? We're not going to get into Hanukkah and all the other ones that they want to bring up pagan celebrations. And by the way, Hanukkah is a pagan celebration. It's not a Bible-honoring, Christ-honoring celebration at all. But we're talking at the beginning about the blessed resurrection. I want to read a few verses to you. First, 
in Acts chapter 4, verse 1. Acts chapter 4, verse 1. I mean, yeah, 4, and we'll start in verse 1. And as they spake unto the people, the priest and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came unto them, being grieved that they taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection of the dead. And they laid hands on them, and they put them in hold until the next day, for it was now eventide. How be it many of them which heard the word believed, and the number of the men was about 5,000, and it came to pass on the morrow that their rulers and elders and scribes and, and, and Annas the high priest and Caiaphas and John and Alexander and many as were of the kindred of the high priest were gathered together at Jerusalem. And when they had set themselves in the midst, they asked, By what power or by what name have ye done this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, Ye rulers of the people and elders of Z of Israel. Well, let me just make the point. Who are the people and the elders of Israel? Obviously, they were all of Israel that were gathered there. This isn't a one world statement, it's an Israelite declaration. Verse 9 If we this day, being examined of the good deed done to the impotent man by which means he is made whole, be it known unto all of you and to all the people of Israel, and by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, which he crucified, whom God raised from the dead. Here is this message of resurrection coming forth. Even by him doth this man stand here before you whole. Marvelous message of healing. Marvelous message of the power of God. His resurrected power. And God's resurrected plan. God has a plan of resurrection, of renewal. And that is the message that is the essential message of the scriptures that points to the scriptures, all scripture points to from Genesis to Revelation. We're going to now look at what is taking place at this time of the world celebration of Christmas. And we want to, if we can, get as much of an understanding of, is it Christian? Is it, is it really biblical, as it would have you think, or is it not? Now, to many of you, you already know this. But I'm on, I want to review many of these things with a number of you, because some of you haven't really thought about it that much, possibly. You're not aware of a lot of things that I'm going to be sharing with you. And there's a lot of things that I, I'll try to bring out, but I'm sure I'm not going to get to them all. But I hope that what I'm going to bring to you today, that the Lord Jesus Christ will bless his word, obviously, and give you light and truth concerning what we, your Christian duty and obligation concerning what the world uh, celebrates as Christmas. Turn your Bibles, please, to Leviticus 18. Levit Leviticus 18 and verse 1. Quote, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, 
speak unto the world. Oops, sorry, I got that wrong again. No, speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, I am the Lord your God. After the doings of the land of Egypt, wherein ye dwelt, which was the known world, known power at that time. May I remind you. Shall ye not do, and after the doings of the land of Canaan, the Canaanite religion, think about it, don't do after the ways of the people of Canaan, these Canaanites. Whether I bring you, shall ye not do, neither shall ye walk in their ordinances, meaning their customs, the manner of their pagan celebrations. Are the American people celebrating Christmas because they believe it's Christian? Why do they tell their children that Santa Claus is coming and if they want Red Santa to get them what they want, then they had better make Santa, Red Santa, happy? That they need to write Santa Claus or to go see him and sit on his lap and get a picture and tell Red Santa what you want for Christmas. Jesus, for the most part, is not in the picture. Jesus is not the reason for the season, as some would tell you, as many of them would want you to believe. But they'll always pull out this Jesus card to make it sound holy if you're going to bring up these uh, arguments and what the Bible says concerning the celebration of Christmas, they'll play their, uh, their Jesus card for you. I've seen it many times. Well, they'll have Santa Claus all over their living room and their Christmas tree and all the Christmas celebrations and all that. And when you bring up some of these questions to them, They'll bring out, actually, they'll bring out a picture of Jesus and set him up in the living room, but right next to where their red Santa Claus is. And it's almost like they're presenting the message to you. Do you want the red Santa God? Oh, if he's not acceptable to you, then we have the G, your Jesus God here so we can make you happy and you'll be comfortable in the celebration of Christmas. Jesus is not in the picture, really. Jesus is not the reason for the season. Why do parents put red stockings of Santa, pictures of Santa, and reindeer? Why do they put them on their walls, by the chimney, or, where, or some convenient place in the living room, by the Christmas tree, or on the Christmas tree? Why do parents sing Red Santa Christmas songs? Again, I'm asking some questions. Is that appropriate? Is that something you sh they should be doing? How did they get to the point where it's acceptable to sing and do these Red Santa Claus things? I've got to mention, as I always do when I'm talking about this subject, you just uh, take the same letters of Santa, rearrange them. It's the same letters for Satan. And Satan is presented as Red Satan. Well, there's your Red Santa Claus, friends. You will f you not find Santa Claus anywhere in the Scriptures. I hardly should even have to mention that, but... I'm going to make that point. Why do parents lie to their children about Santa Claus? The reindeer, the North Pole, 
elves, and many other fantasy Christmas stories? Why do they lie to their children? I want you to think about that. Is that biblical? Is that holy? Is that righteousness? Is that something we should be celebrating, have jolly merriment on our faces and celebrate that? Or is it something we should avoid at all cost? That we should flee from such unbiblical things? Doesn't that make sense to you as a Bible-reading, Bible-believing person? I'm going to have you turn in your Bibles to John chapter 4. John chapter 4, and let's go to verse 23. I thought these verses have some significance, especially in this topic that we're talking about concerning Christmas, the un-Christmas message. Quote, But the hour cometh and now is, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship him. In spirit and in truth? See, these verses... I I mean, to me, it's clear that we should not be involved in idolatry at all. But if this is the true worship, and this is the true um, way that we should be worshiping as Christians, then all other forms of worship are what? Idolatry. Amen? Next verse. God is a spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Again, we are to worship Jesus, what does it say? In spirit and in truth. Not in a lie. Worshiping in a lie or a falsehood is therefore what? Falsehood. And what does the Bible say about that? And worshiping in a lie. If you're worshiping in a lie, that's idolatry. That's promoting idolatry. That's living in an idolatrous way. I don't care how many smiles and songs of joy you may engage in. Is putting a smile on your children's face because of idolatry a righteous thing that you should be proud of? It's a hard reality. Uh, yes, I realize that's what we're talking about. It's a very hard reality. But let's, let's not avoid reality. Let's not avoid the truth. Christmas and the Christmas tree is what? Christmas and the Christmas tree and celebrating the Christmas tree, and engaging in all that's surrounding that is what? It's engaging in false worship. We are to what? Flee from paganism. Flee from idolatry. Not to run to it and not to embrace it. I mean, what are you uh, a lot of you that call yourselves Christians, and again, if the shoe fits, wear it. If it doesn't, well, I'm good. I would like to think that a number of you are not in. I'm not here. I'm here, and I'm speaking, speaking this message to try to appeal to you on biblical truth. That's it. I have no other agenda. Folks, if you, again, could understand 
the idolatry that a lot of people are engaged in in, the, in this world today, and they don't realize the many forms of idolatry that they're engaged in, it's really, well, it almost brings tears to your eyes, and it ought to bring tears to your eyes. But we are to flee from paganism. A joyful heart does not make paganism some holy event. It's still pagan. It's still forbidden by the Word of God. I want you to turn now to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and let's go to uh, verse 19. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 19. Quote, Quench not the Spirit, despise not prophesying, prove, now notice this, prove all, not some, not, well, except Christmas because it brings such joy and happiness to our children. And it's a great time to get together, have a fit Christmas feast and get all the little goodies and presents under the Christmas tree. But it says, prove all things, hold fast that which is good. The question is, is Christmas within the category of good? Verse 22, abstain from all appearance of evil. Think about it. Abstain from all, not some, but all appearance of evil. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray, God, your whole, whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless, meaning without corruption unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. We're, that's our duty and what, how we're supposed to maintain ourselves and behave until the Lord Jesus comes. Well, I, when I read those words, prove all things, I thought about that and I thought, you know, that means don't embrace it. Don't embrace things because the world does so. Now, you may think that's a mute point, but it's an important point. Why do a lot of people do it? Why do they celebrate Christmas? Well, because the world does it. Well, because my church, the Judeo-Christian church that I go to, s sanctions it and gives their approval to it. It's, a, it's saying here that we are to hold to the good, that which is biblical in other words, and in keeping with God's biblical design and purposes, flee from that which is bad, that which is of a world, worldly influence, prove all things, use the wor word of God, therefore, to prove all things whether they be good or bad, and flee from evil. Flee from evil, meaning what God's Word describes as evil. That, I mean, I've got to put it in those terms because that's really what it means to flee from evil. Don't use your heart to determine what's good or bad or evil. Don't use your friends or your family to put their approval on things and therefore, oh, it's okay because my family does it or because my friends do so. Use the Word of God. And why are we to use the Word of God? Because it's the highest authority, period. Period. A righteous, godly authority. And the best way to test things, is it not? The highest form and way of testing things. It is the best way to know what truly is good and what is evil. Isaiah chapter 8, please turn there. Isaiah 8 and verse 
18. Behold, I and the children whom the Lord hath given me are for signs and for wonders in Israel for the Lord of hosts, which dwelleth in Mount Zion. And when they shall say unto you, Seek unto them that have familiar spirits. Notice, when they, the world, says, Seek unto them that have familiar spirits, or unto wizards that peep and that mutter. Should not a people seek unto the Lord, unto the God Almighty? What a question. For the living to the dead, should they seek the dead? Verse 20, to the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, God's holy word, it is because there is no light in them. I mean, we're getting into some heavy truth, heavy doses of reality from the Scripture. That's what we should be feeding on. That's what we should be guiding our lives by. Those are the customs, biblical customs, that we should adhere to and live according to. Folks, I don't care if Charles Dickens wrote some Christmas play and it sounds so righteous and holy and godly to you. It's not a godly celebration. Charles Dickens is not to be your authority and guide. To those who celebrate Christmas and all its festivities, may I use the word of God to challenge, even spoil, your Christmas celebration? To those who celebrate Christmas, may I use the word of God to reason with you and your reason for reveling in Christmas joy? What is that Christmas joy First of that all, the world has, what is it based upon? Is it based upon the real Christ, the real Messiah and His Word, or is it based upon paganism? But the world loves Christmas time, you may say. Yes, the world also loves homosexuality. Many of them, let's face the facts, I mean, folks, I know hundreds, maybe, of older folks, sad to say mostly women, that were against homosexuality 50 years ago, but now that the president's given his seal of approval, now that Congress said it's okay, now that the ju judiciary branch said it's okay, and now that Judeo-Christian churches are celebrating and ordaining them, it's got to be okay and oh, I've had so many old ladies over the years, excuse my language here, but it's the truth, old ladies in many cases that I would think would be staunch Bible-believing people like my grandmother was. And I guarantee you she didn't put up with that. To her dying day she didn't put up with that. But I've had so many of them tell me, oh, but they're such fun, the homosexuals. Oh, uh, they're, they're such a joy to talk to. And why do you say that? Well, I've talked to a lot of men that have the opposite feeling about it. And I'm wondering, why is it that the women, older women, not totally picking on them, but in many cases it's a reality. Whether you understand it or like what I'm saying or not, it's a reality. Why? Oh, they're so kind to me. They, 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 they come and, and will talk and... and I'm like, well, they talk like a girl. They act like a woman. They're effeminized. But they're getting involved in the celebration. But that's just one example. They, the world embraces homosexuality, does it not? So should we... Should we uh, uh, we could use that excuse, or well, you know, let's because they're doing so, 
Let's just let our guard down. Let's let our defenses down. Let's put aside what the Word of God says, and let's embrace homosexuality. Let's, let's all join in the effeminization that's taking place in the world today. No. No. No, we should not participate and encourage and put our seal of approval on lewdness, worldliness, corruption, liberalism. We don't want to be man-pleasers, especially to be accepted by the world rather than be Jesus Christ-pleasers and Word of God obeyers. That's what we should be. James, go to the book of James, please. Verse 4. You know, to preach against sin, it's not, in many cases, it's not acceptable. It's not highly looked upon. It doesn't make you feel good to preach against sin. It really doesn't. I mean, we could go through like the examples I just went through with you. And... Uh, you know, it, it, it upsets many people's apple cart, whatever the apple cart it, cart is for them. It upsets it. And I don't mean to be a, well, we'll use the language that the world likes to use this time of year, a Scrooge. So daring to be a Scrooge, in fact, I might, well, I'm not going to go there. But I say, I'll just uh, say, People don't like their reality upset. When they they have the world approval and their church approval and uh, their friends approval and their status approval with the world out there, it's all set and it's all lined up and we're all joined in and and, and, uh, we're all engaged in this Christmas celebration. Somebody like you, Pastor Barley, coming along and throwing a monkey wrench in, it's, we're not going to like you too much. In fact, I'm not invited to some of my children's house at this time of year because they don't want their children to hear from Grandpa that he might not, that uh, the Word of God, is, what the Word of God says about the celebration of Christmas and that it's not Christian it's not biblical, and they shouldn't be engaged in that. And Santa Claus doesn't, li- doesn't exist. Santa Claus is a lie. Santa Claus is a myth, and your parents shouldn't be lying to you about Santa Claus. Because that's what this grandfather does. James 4. Well, we'll go to verse 4 in James 4. <laughs> Oh, strong words here at the beginning, right? Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that fellowship with the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Think about this. And you need to think about it on a deeper level than possibly what a number of you may be thinking or what your understanding may be telling you of what this verse is saying. Ye adulterers and adulteresses. What does this mean? It means ye which adulterate. Ye which adulterate the word of God. Ye which pleasure yourselves in the ways of the world. And let's face it, that's what they're doing. Come out of her, my people, and not be partakers of her sins. Understand that being a friend of the world is the same as as being an enemy with God. So what are people doing in celebrating Christmas? They're actually being and acting as enemies of God. My God, is that how you want to be? Now, you can push aside what I'm saying. Those, some, those of you out there getting the DVDs and uh, because you're celebrating Christmas and run to some Judeo-Christian minister and tell him what Pastor Barley said, and he'll pat you on the back and make you feel real good and tell you, no, no, don't listen to him. This is really a Christmas celebration. This is really a Christian thing to do. 
Let's go on, though, reading in these verses here in James chapter 4 and verse 5. James chapter 4, verse 5. Do you think that the Scripture saith in vain? In other words, is Scripture wasting its time? The spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to enemy, uh, envy, but he giveth more grace. Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud. This is what the word of God says. But giveth grace unto the humble. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil. Meaning, it literally means adversary. The deceiver. Your carnality, which is enmity with God. Isn't that what the scriptures say? So when you're resisting the devil, you're resisting the carnality in your mind. Your mind is where a lot of lusting. That's where a lot of the deception takes place. In your mind. And your minds have to be, biblically what it say, renewed. Resist that carnality. And it will flee from you. Don't give in to your carnality. It will only grow. It will become, only become more of an adversary, more of a problem. If you're into lust, if you're into this, if you're into that, that are bad things, you don't submit to them. You don't yield to them. You fight the carnality. You fight that adversary. You can say, oh, I'm going to fight the devil. I'm going to fight. I don't believe in you, Pastor. I think it's a literal devil. I'm going to fight that devil. Oh, that devil. Come on, devil. I'm going to take you on. What is the devil doing to you? A lot of times you don't even stop and think deeply enough at those people that are going to do that. And what is the devil doing to me? But when you think about your mind, it comes from, my, oh, my mind is the tempter. My carnality is the tempter. My carnality is bringing in enmity here, I've got to pray against it. I've got to stand against it. I've got to speak the word of God against you, carnal, carnal thinking mind. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil. Resist the adversary. Draw nigh to God, verse 8, and he will draw nigh to you. Do this. It's what the scripture, draw, draw nigh to him and his word and his purposes. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners. Purify your heart, which really means your mind, ye double-minded. You know, to me, uh, the celebration of Christmas is like Judeo-Christianity. It's a double-mindedness. It's an adulteration. I'm going to make a very important statement. I pray it will have some serious impact on your heart and spirit. Nowhere in the New Testament will you find one Bible passage in which Christians, the disciples, the Israelites, or the church celebrates Christ's birth. Not one. Not one. Now you got to stop and you have to think about that. You will find no Chris, Christmas celebration in which Christians celebrate the birth of Christ whatsoever in the Scriptures. Now, that one, huh? Yeah, we're going to get into that just a, a little bit here. Seventy to 90 years after the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, will you find any scripture validity for celebrating the so-called Christmas holiday? Because we're looking at, at uh, the time when the book of Revelation was written. You will find nowhere where the disciples, where the church, where the Israelites gathered together and, and celebrated and stressed the importance of celebrating, quote, Christmas. Seventy to ninety years. 
Come on, don't you think in those 70 to 90 years, there would be one year there where they, where they, could, they could show us, the Word of God would show us as a biblical example, if it's so important, such a worldly, gleeful time to do this, to celebrate, that we would find that in the Scriptures. Yeah, it didn't even give us a date of his birth. I mean, there's so many things there that we have to bring up and we'll have to look at that um, just make this much more of a troubling revelation when we look at the reality and the facts concerning this. It's important that Jesus was born I am not in disagreement with that whatsoever. It's important. His kingdom's important. His death is important because if he hadn't died, where would we be? But his resurrection is also important. And I'm thinking here, looking at all the scripture verses, I've looked at uh, lots of them. We may, we weren't only going over just a few of them here at the beginning with you about the resurrection. But wow, let me tell you, that's way more significant and biblical. And it's what Christians ought to be celebrating. Because without his resurrection, you have no hope. Our hope is in his resurrection. The scriptures tell us that over and over and over. That's what we are to be glorying in. That's what we are to be celebrating. As was stated earlier, Christmas was brought about mainly through the Catholic Church hundreds of years later. They came and set their Catholic ritualism, established their Catholic ritual, a Catholic custom, not biblical, but they established a Catholic creed making a pagan celebration into also a, quote, Christmas celebration, or trying to Christianize that which is pagan. It's like taking pig and Christianizing it and telling everybody it's okay to eat now because we've Christianized it. It's like taking homosexuality and saying a Catholic prayer over it and sprinkling it with holy water and saying it's okay to be a homosexual now. I mean, how far do you want to go with this, folks? Is it biblical or is it pagan? They took paganism and blended it with their church rituals. Christmas is a Catholic church ritual. It is not Christian. And let me tell you, there is a lot of history that we could go over concerning that. If you're so interested in it, do your own research on it. I'm just telling you the facts right here. For lack of time, I can't go on and do it much more. But I would have you turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. I love these verses. And you should too, obviously. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Think about Christmas celebration. Think about the world loving the Christmas celebration. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? There should be no unity. There should be no fellowship. Next verse, verse 15. And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? 
there should be no fellowship again. And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols and idolatry and idol worship and all that surrounds that celebration of idolatry and paganism? For ye are the temple of the living God. Wow. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate. Don't unite with them, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. You know, what's an un- is a Christmas tree a clean thing? Is Santa Claus a clean thing? When you see the smile on your children's face when they're uh, unwrapping their gifts around the Christmas tree, is that really a Christian clean thing? Is that really Christmas, Jesus Christ loving, Bible loving joy upon their faces? I tell you, we're getting into some serious reality. I hope you realize. I hope your heart and, and, and your mind is really listening to what the Scriptures are telling us here. Verse 17. Wherefore, come out from among them. Isn't that what the Bible says in Revelations 18? And be not partakers of her sins. And it says, And be ye separate, saith the Lord, and not, touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. Don't you want to be received by Him, by the Lord Jesus Christ? Yes. And I will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Wow. Great verses. Is Christmas really a time of year in which the world celebrates Jesus and his birth? Are they really seeking to be holy, more Christian, more dedicated to the Lord Jesus Christ, may I ask? Is it an established fact that Jesus was not even born on Christmas, quote, Christmas time? Do your research on it. He was born during the month of September. He was not, I don't care how you slice it or dice it, he was not born in the month of December. So therefore, why should we even be celebrating his birth at that time of year anyway? Yet the Judeo-Christians Celebrate it. You know who else celebrates it? Which I got into a little bit ago. I'm going to get into it a little bit deeper now. And that is Hollywood. Christian loving Jesus Christ, Bible believing Hollywood loves Christmas. They love to make Christmas movies and sing Christmas music. The merchants is enthusiastically play Christmas music. The media all come out. I've seen them time and time again come out dressed in red Santa Claus hats and sing Yule time songs. And the Judeo Christians join right in with "Here comes Santa Claus! Here comes Santa Claus!" Right down Santa Claus Lane. I mean, you know, really. Santa Claus and merriment. Oh, no, Pastor, you're, you're trying to mess it all up. It's really about Jesus. And yet, I go to their home, and I don't see Jesus anywhere. I see the Christmas tree. I see red Santa Claus stockings. I see Santa Claus all over the place with reindeer. Yeah, Frosty and the elves and all that stuff. I look at their kids. They run around with... Uh, Santa, with Christmas tree stuff all over their pajamas and, and Santa Claus. Really? 
Who are you kidding? And they all have, again, numerous sometimes Christmas trees on display. I was watching a show the other uh, day on Fox, and Paula D. They invite she invited everybody. And she's one of these cooks. Invited everybody in her house. She has a huge bathroom. And in her bathroom, right next to her tub, she has a highly, this big Christmas tree all decorated right next to her bathroom tub. Really? And they're all lit up and decorated superbly. Really? They, they, they spend... They have that much love, that much respect for the Christmas tree. And what is a Christmas tree? It's the center of attention. It's the center of, dare I say, yes I do, so worship. Washington, D.C., as an example, every year brings in a huge Christmas tree and they deck it and they dress it all up with all kinds of ornaments, lights, and glitter. And they're doing so because they have now found Jesus Christ? Hardly. Is it all because they want the world to know Jesus? Is that why Washington, D.C. does it? In New York City, Right next to the Rockefeller Center, interestingly enough, they put up another massive Christmas tree and they dress it with all kinds of fanciful decorations. Not in celebration of Christ, no. Well then, what are they celebrating? Just what is the Christmas tree all about? What is its origin? What is its purpose? Is a Christmas tree really Christian? And should Christians be setting up some evergreen Christmas tree in their house and making it the center of attention? Their center of worship? Because this is where they gather, and this is where they are, quote, blessed under the Christmas tree and all the Christmas gifts, that'll bring joy to their hearts, the center of their delight and glory. Turn to Isaiah 57, verse 3. Isaiah 57, verse 3. But draw near hither, ye sons of sorceress, the seed of adulterer, the adulterer, and the whore, against whom do ye sport yourselves? I like that. I like the way it's said. Whom do ye sport yourselves? And that's what's happening under the, by the Christmas tree. Against whom ye uh, make ye a wide mouth and draw out the tongue. Don't they do that? Look at their expressions. Look at the pomp and, and religiosity that people display at this time of year. Are ye not children of transgression, the Bible says? A seed of falsehood? You're all liars, that's what the Bible's saying. Inflaming yourselves, look at this, with idols under Every green tree. Look at the gifts. They're idols for their children to open, to win their children's hearts, to tell them Santa Claus came down the, this uh, chimney. Oh, wait a minute, we don't have a chimney. Oh, well, you know, but Santa Claus brought this for you. And uh, children, don't forget, leave milk and cookies to fatten Santa Claus up. This jolly red Santa Claus. Idols under every green tree, but then slaying the children in the valleys under the cliffs of the rocks. What do they do? They're slaying their spirit. They're destroying their spirit. They're destroying their children in this. They're lying to their children. 
Does it sound familiar what we're reading here? What do people put under the green tree? Idols of the heart in many circumstances. The world does not give out some Christian joy or hope. They give gifts that feed the flesh. Let's be realistic about it. They're giving gifts, but gifts which feed the flesh. During the Roman celebration of the Feast of Saturnalia, the pagans did uh, decorate their houses with clippings of evergreen shrubs. They also decorated uh, living trees with bits of metal and replicas of their god, and their main god was Bacchus. And Bacchus was the Roman god of agriculture and wine. There's a lot more I could say about it. You could do your own research on him. B-A-C-C-H-U-S. Oliver Cromwell preached against the heathen tradition of Christmas, of singing Christmas carols, the decoration of trees, and any joyful expression and decoration. In America, the pilgrims, the second governor, William Bradford, who was a Calvinist, he did his best to stamp out that pagan holiday called Christmas. The pilgrims and the Puritans did not celebrate, quote, Christmas. Oh, they must have been such unchristian people. No, they were holy and righteous. They were biblical. Here's another example. There are so many I, I could give you on this, but I picked out a few. In 1851, Pastor Henry Shawan, S-C-H-W-A-N, he's out of Ohio, Christmas trees in the church. But you know what the people of that pastor back in 1851 did? Uh, he... he uh, I've kind of messed the story up, but I've got to get it right. He, he is the very first pastor in the first church to recognize it, and the people came against him and even threatened him violence if he ever brought it up again. That was the only, that was the first time in 1851 with this pastor, Pastor Henry Schwann, that did this. That was the very first time. And the people threatened him with violence if he did it again. They were that staunch and dedicated to what the Word of God says. But that's powerful. What a story. Turn to Jeremiah. My time's up here. Jeremiah 10, verse 1. I have to read these verses. Jeremiah 10, verse 1. Concerning the Christmas tree. Hear ye the word which the Lord speaketh unto you, O house of Israel. Boy, the word of God is just so uh, racist, really, you know. Why is it to the world? Why is it always to the house of Israel? I don't know. Verse 2, Thus saith the Lord, Yahweh, Learn not the way of the heathen, now we can just stop there. What are they doing in Christmas, this Christmas celebrate? Learn the way of the heathen. And be not dismayed at the signs of the heaven, for the heathen are dismayed at them. They're paying attention to the signs of the heaven. Always look at the heavens. Now, there's a biblical way to do that, and there's a heathen way to do it, that the zodiac and all that. Verse 3. <clears throat> for the customs, ordinances are, of the, or rituals, for the customs of the people are what? Vain. For one cutteth a tree out of the forest. Gee, that sounds so familiar. One cutteth a tree out of the forest. 
the work of the hands of the workmen with the axe. They deck it with silver and with gold. They fasten it with nails and with hammers that it move not. Scriptures tell us this is an evil practice. Don't be engaged in it. Don't do it. What is a Christmas tree? It's a symbol of idolatry and paganism. Therefore, it is an evil celebration, and we should not be partaking of it. I don't care how much the world embraces it, how much they love it. Our message is the Bible message. The Bible message of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ and the kingdom of God and His purposes. That's what we should be celebrating. My time is out this morning. I pray this has been a spiritual, biblical message of light to many of you and help awaken you. If it has helped you, please write me and let me know because we want the truth to come out because the truth in the Lord Jesus Christ will set us all free. Amen. Amen. Lord Jesus, we love you. We love your purposes. We love your word. We want to hear your word. We want to be adherers and followers of your word and your kingdom purposes. Amen and amen.